Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to punch, chop, and kick through the greatest era of action movies, 1975 to 1995. Oh, that was good. You did work on it. I thought you were lying. Hey. I made a promise and I kept it. Right up until 15 minutes before we recorded. <laughs> and you and looked it up online it and found something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this week, we have a special episode. This is out of the ordinary for not just the Miami Vice version of this podcast, but then also the movie version of the podcast. Although I highly, highly encourage you if you have uh, about an hour and a half. I don't know. You do on a road trip out to see family this week for Thanksgiving here in the U.S. That you put on the showdown in a little Tokyo episode we did last week. It is by far... <laughs> The funniest episode we have ever made. And yeah, I don't, I don't like to throw that around a lot. You know that we're just amazing. <laughs> but that was easily <laughs> the funniest episode we've ever made. But this week, we're going to break the mold. We talked about that for this movie podcast, that we can do things that are um, different. Do a different take on things or put th- package things together in a different way. Do some experiments. Step outside of the normal rundowns that, that we do. And this week, for the week of Thanksgiving, is our opportunity to be able to do that. Because we want you, we're asking you, dear listener, that this week, on the long weekend of Thanksgiving weekend, that you sit down and spend some time with your best friend, Rocky Balboa. Because we're going to talk about the entire Rocky franchise through the lens of Rocky 3. And lucky for you, of the eight movies that exist for Rocky, five of them are on Netflix And then Rocky Balboa is on Amazon Prime. And the Creed movies are easily available at basically anywhere where you can stream. I don't know if they're free on any of them. but Oh, no, they're on those free, like the Tubi and those things. Oh, yeah. So there's no excuse. You should be able to watch it this week. So no one in the history of watching movies is going to be able to say, I've never seen a Rocky movie. God, I hope. What kind of life have you been living? (laughs) Do yourself a favor and watch at least one. (laughs) At least the original Rocky. (laughs) I I think Rocky is one of those franchises that even if you try, you can't avoid seeing at least one of them. Whether you watch the original ones or... Just seen the new reboots. Like you've seen a Balboa. I would I would say that, but we do have someone in our family. I will not say her name, <laughs> who had never seen Rocky up until like last year. So. <laughs> Jenna. <laughs> As I mentioned, we're going to be discussing Rocky through the lens of Rocky Three. So we're going to spend some extended time with that movie because we think that that's like a. Solid transition that happens in the movie. So the first two are great. Three is great. The rest of them are great. We're, they're we, all great. Yeah, they're Let's get all, that straight. <laughs> <laughs> they're all amazing movies. Um, I think the first one is the introduction. The second one is kind of fun. The third one's where we start to get serious. And of course, you can't talk about Rocky without the never give up, like always pick yourself up theme that happens in all of the movies. But I, we specifically in in all of our rundown that we're going to talk about when it comes to all of the Rocky movies through and then with Rocky three is not just the never give up, but also not letting the world tell you who you're supposed to be. The world is always telling Rocky he's only good enough to do this. He should only be able to do that. And yet he goes out, continues to prove them wrong. And a phrase that I'm going to say a lot throughout this rundown is courage is being afraid and doing it anyway and that's where he finds himself a lot and especially in rocky 3 that's another moment that's inside of this movie we're just going to get right into our rocky rundown and go through the movies in order starting at the very beginning spend some extra time with rocky 3 and then go all the way through the 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 two creed movies so before we get started i want to run through directors and writers and premiere dates of the rocky movies the reason i want to start off with that is because there's a reason why we chose Rocky to discuss the week of Thanksgiving. Of the eight movies, six of them come out between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Here's the rundown on the directors and writers and everything on the creation of all the Rocky movies. Rocky 1 premiered November 21st, 1976. It is directed by John Avildsen. Yeah, he, he directed some movies that you may have heard of. Karate Kid, Karate Kid Part 2, Lean on Me. Oh, and Inferno. Which stars JCBD, Danny Trio, and Pat Morita. Wow, hey. that's a list. <laughs> and why have I not seen that movie? <laughs> we're we're going to watch that this weekend. <laughs> he also won an Academy Award for Best Director for Rock. So that's, he actually 
Yep. Original Rocky is an Academy Award yes, winning movie. Yes, it is. I did know that. Rocky II premiered June 15th, 1979. It is directed and written by Sylvester Stallone. Rocky III premiered May 28th, 1982. Written, directed, Sylvester Stallone. Rocky IV premiered November 27th, 1985. Written and directed, Sylvester Stallone. I see a trend. <laughs> Rocky V, directed by John Avildsen, so he comes back. He, the original director comes back and directs Rocky V. Written by Sylvester Stallone, premiered December, sorry, November 16th, 1990. Then Rocky Balboa, written and directed by Sylvester Stallone, premieres December 20th, 2006. There's a 16-year gap between mm-hmm. Rocky V and Rocky Balboa. Then, of course, the Creed movies. Uh, Creed One premiered November 19, 2015, directed by Ryan Coogler and written by Coogler and Aaron Covington. And then Creed Two premiered November 14, 2018, directed by Stephen Cappell Jr., written by Sylvester Stallone, Jewel Taylor, Sasha Penn, and Chio Hodari Coker. It's like a, a a team that did the story and a team that did the screenplay. Gotcha. So that's like why there's so many writers that that are on. Yep. Yep. Gotcha. So before before I got into it, I, I just wanted to talk about the season and then obviously Sylvester Stallone's involvement, which John's going to get into in the guest stars, but the involvement of Sylvester Stallone and throughout this because he created it, and you can tell when it's a sly movie when he's behind the camera versus the ones where he's not behind the camera you can tell the tone yes the visual difference with, between the two yeah you can definitely tell the difference between the two there's a different tone and like structure to everything in the way that he does it so without further ado this is the go with the heat treatment on the rocky franchise obviously want to start at the very very beginning and start with rocky one and our excitement to talk about rocky because we've been talking about this all week in preparation to be able to discuss this and then watching rocky three in the very very beginning with rocky one there's a big backstory not gonna get into it about the backstory about how the movie got made let's just talk a little bit about the movie itself this mindset that rocky that sylvester stallone brings into it of the the courage is being afraid is still doing it anyway and finally get seeing the opportunity and taking advantage of it in rocky one he is as i mentioned the world is telling him what to be he's just hired muscle that's also like emptying spit buckets at the gym yeah he's a goon he's a that's what he is he goes and collects money he's he's yeah just he collects money and breaks people's legs and does like that kind of stuff and then because he wants to be a boxer he empty spit buckets at the gym. <laughs> <laughs> He's barely well, making it. it He's got a dismal life doing that. He's not happy doing that. You know, at the time, he really kind of embodies a lot of blue collar people, especially being from like a blue collar town like Philadelphia. He really kind of embodied like a lot of people who just dreamed of making it in something like a like football or boxing or something. But instead, we're working at a meat packers plant. Don't forget. In the original Rocky, who the characters are when we meet them, and then as we go through this, who they become by the end of Rocky. Now, <laughs> those that make it to the end of, yeah. like, by the end of Rocky Balboa, but who they are in the very, very beginning, who Polly is, who Adrian is, who Rocky is. Now, Rocky, for the most part, he stays the same. Yeah. Money changes you. That that happens throughout there, but that's all. That's just part of the story. Yeah. about how money changes him. It's an accurate portrayal of somebody who is comes from nothing and becomes this like super megastar and then in turn falls back down again because of the the lifestyle that he's living. Like that that's that's true. That's how that works. Mm-hmm. But everybody else stays they change drastically like Polly and Adrian and even Mickey, right? right? I mean, he doesn't even make it all the way to the end, but he changes as he goes. Yeah, and let's let's be honest, you know, Rocky's his character doesn't really change. Uh, but he's also kind of the not the brightest of the group. He's less influenced. Uh, okay, but Polly is the, clearly the loose, the loose <laughs> one of that thread. Okay, <laughs> like I understand that Rocky's not going to be, he's not going to go be a rocket scientist or something. But Polly can't even tie his own shoes sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, with, with Rocky, Adrian is so shy, but Rocky is so raw and so honest and just so just he's comfortable with who he is yeah that's how he eventually wins her over and that's this message of rocky the man Mm -hmm. rocky the man that we're talking about in this breakdown and why we want people more people to spend more time watching rocky yeah is rocky the man he is comfortable with who he is and and in times in his life he questions that in the later movies but he's always comfortable with who he is and number one in his world is always the people that are closest to him even if they betray him. Down the line, Polly messes up, but 
in the end, he's still there with him in Rocky Balboa. He's, he's in there with him. That's just the two of them, basically. First one, basically, you have Rocky, like we said. He's kind of a goon, kind of a wannabe boxer. And he gets the ultimate underdog story. He gets this opportunity, especially at the time. Like, like this could never happen. Mm-hmm. This day and age and kind of social media, like if you maybe if you had like a, a video blow up of you beating someone up, maybe you could get this to happen but back then like there was just no shot that you were just gonna get handed an opportunity to fight the champ a sign of its time in all these movies and that's where there needs to be some forgiveness given here and there but they're they're capsules of time from when they got released right and so with apollo creed being the reigning heavyweight champion and he is trying to figure out a way to get ratings up to be able to get more money out of the gate because and he picks rocky because he's the italian stallion and how that's going to look on posters and advertising yeah but never really believing that rocky has any chance to beat him it's like a joke to him Mm -hmm. he doesn't train as hard he's out there showboating it he's hanging out doing all kinds of stuff he's not taking it serious because this is just some punk kid who cleans up spit buckets (laughs) so Mm -hmm. he has no real chance Mm -hmm. and that's why they pick him literally they pick him because he has no chance it's funny because that's uh how his kid gets his first opportunity in creed is they literally pick him because he has no chance at all of uh of beating this guy who's it's going to be his last fight probably with mickey where he comes into in the original rocky he's got nobody his yeah. life is boxing and whatever yeah. happened previously in his life that's he's just that's where he is now right and when rocky gets this opportunity and mickey comes to him and says i'll be your trainer rocky doesn't turn him away now Rock, rocky needs to help to, and he doesn't know that many people But regardless of how Mickey treated him in the past, he has his inner circle and he's loyal to them no matter what. Rocky the man. Yeah. Also, Mickey doesn't believe he can win, though. Right. I mean, that's like from the beginning. I don't think he actually truly believes he can win, but he's going to train him because he's going to get like get money and it's going to get limelight and it's going to be like it'll shadow his uh, it'll put a spotlight on his gym. because That's his gym that he has. And so that's why he like he actually wants to train him because of that. He said he has potential, but I don't think he actually really believed that Rocky could win. And then in Rocky 2, when winning is suddenly a possibility and that inner circle starts to grow tighter and tighter and tighter in what the opportunities are that are in front of them. And Rocky, the man, starts becoming Rocky, the husband, and taking care of Adrian and how that relationship grows and how his relationship grows with Mickey, where Mick becomes like his dad and not his trainer. Exactly. And obviously in 2, he has a son. So that changes it. He has a child. And yeah, he's... Mm-hmm. But remember in, in 2, he's also kind of showboating. He's got money and he's got... This is the first time they've ever got money. They buy this house. And then it ends up that he's not actually doing anything. He can't be in these commercials because he's not smart enough to like read the lines correctly <laughs> and buy this house. Not a big house, a regular house. But it's hard because Adrian has to work and she's really super pregnant and they're barely making it. And, you know, there's all that turmoil. Like if something happens to her and she almost loses the baby. But there you go. There's Rocky the man. He's still there trying to take care of him and like do what he's supposed to do. At the end of the first movie, he loses to Apollo Creed, but he earns his respect and everything. Rocky 2 is, is mostly about like he's made it. But it's not what he expected it to be. In number two is where he actually wins the heavyweight title. At the end of one, no one gave him a chance. He held his own, but he still lost. So that means in within the history books, when people look back, they're going to yeah. look at Apollo Creed and see win Rocky Balboa 15 rounds. Mm-hmm. Right? They're, they're, there's no context in the history books to say like how much heart and effort and everything that he did to be able to get there. And the world said, listen, that was a fluke. You're not good enough to be able to do this again. In two, he gets those sponsorships. He starts making a little bit more money. They tell him, too dumb, dude. Like, you're not going to make, like, capitalize on this stuff while you can because it's never, this it's is not never gonna going to come around. Like, with Rocky in two and knowing, like, okay, Rock, you have the permission now to actually compete and now to prove to everyone that it wasn't just a fluke, that you can actually compete with Apollo Creed. And at every turn, everyone wants to give, like, the benefit of the doubt to us, like, oh, well, Apollo Creed's at the end of his career. Like, yeah, everyone keeps saying old. that, like, he's, that's why you won, he's old. But he's a champion, but it doesn't matter now because Rocky's the champion, he's got the belt. So mm-hmm. he's going to have, like, the world's going to open up for him, right? <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. It opens up so he can fight Hulk Hogan. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Thunderlips. Eventually lip. he gets a robot, and that's kind of cool. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Pa- actually, Polly gets a robot, <laughs> technically. <laughs> so before we get into Rocky Three and going deep into how Three represents all of those themes the best way, Rocky the Man, Never Give Up, Don't Let the World Tell You What You're Supposed to Be, that Rocky Three really embodies those. Let's pause right here and talk about the guest stars, the Rocky guest stars. Because obviously, over a long p- period of time, there's been a lot of guest stars in these movies. But eh, when you look at it, maybe it's not as many as what you remember. All that matters is is the p- those people that have appeared, the core people, because those people, those roles transcend every movie from every decade. There's one of these characters in there. So, John, what do you have for us this week in guest stars? Yeah, so this week, you know, looking over the, all of, obviously, it would be too much to try and do every guest star in all seven eight movies so we tried to focus on the people who were in the core group of actors in the majority of the movies let's just start with the big guy himself sylvester stallone like you said he wrote all six rocky movies well he also wrote cobra driven most of or if not all of the rambo movies as well as co-writing fist over the top cliffhanger <laughs> and rhinestone which he actually he co-wrote and sings on the soundtrack like that's a he plays a country music star in that movie with and dolly parton i didn't know with he dolly wrote parton that. that's the surprising part he actually wrote that it wasn't just like he got coaxed into it thinking of that movie you're like this is what he wanted to do <laughs> yes I, i'm yeah. gonna admit How something. Can I... I actually like rhinestone <laughs> i mean that's probably not surprising because i like everything that <laughs> He does, but like, I like that movie. (laughs) It's okay, you know. So (laughs) it's the Elton John version of Urban Cowboy. (laughs) Don't you talk about Urban Cowboy? I'll fight you over that. Sylvester Stallone got to start in the early 70s, mostly doing some bit parts. First breakout role was starring opposite Henry Winkler, the Fonz, in a teen gang movie called The Lords of Flatbush in 1974. <laughs> that movie would start to gain him more traction. His biggest role around this time would be Machine Gun Joe Viterbo in <laughs> 1975's Death Race 2000. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Uh, that is that is an amazing. You know what? If you got extra time this Thanksgiving weekend, watch the original Death Race. That is an amazing movie. Or don't. <laughs> <laughs> right after Death Race, that he actually wrote Rocky, and it was inspired by the Muhammad Ali and Chuck Webner fight. Webner was a huge underdog. Uh, he probably had no business being uh, being given a fight with Muhammad Ali, but actually turned into a really good fight in 1975. Rocky is just a powerhouse. It, it was nominated te- for 10 Academy Awards. It ended up winning Best Picture. And it sparked a ton of stuff. But as I said, uh, he's written a ton of his own movies himself anyway. Once the Rocky franchise would get going, he would do Rambo and the First Blood and First Blood Part 2. And he would follow that up with movies like Cobra, Over the Top, and Tango and Cash. So pretty much all through the 80s, he was just your mainstream blockbuster action star. Going into the 90s, he would have he would go a little bit more sci-fi with Demolition Man and then Judge Dredd. He would also start to dabble in some comedies too, like Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. He would end the 90s better with Copland. Since then, he has kind of had a rebirth late in his career with movies like The Expendables. He's coming out with a new Rambo, uh, several new Rambo movies, plus the Creed movies. On top of writing movies and acting in movies, he also has done some soundtrack work. He sang the song Too Close to Paradise. In his movie Paradise Alley in 1978, as I said, he sang several duets with Dolly Parton in 84's Rhinestone. And he even directed. He directed Staying Alive, which is the sequel to Saturday Night Fever, starring John Travolta, but also featuring several Frank Stallone songs, which we'll talk about also in music. (laughs) Okay, so let's get to Apollo Creed, played by Carl Weathers. Carl Weathers is a former football star who played at San Diego State and actually played linebacker and defensive end. He actually signed with the Oakland Raiders and played in seven games in 1970 for them and one game in 1971 before being released. So he was a bona fide football player, Carl Weathers. After being released by the Raiders, he would go on to play several years in the CFL for the BC Lions as well. Hmm. Finally, he would give up football and pursue his acting career in 1974. He would get his first two roles 
in several small black exploitation movies called Friday Foster and Bucktown. He would also make guest appearances on the TV shows Good Times, Kung Fu, and Starsky and Hutch. Yeah. And he would actually criticize Sly's acting ability, which would help when he auditioned for the role of Apollo Creed, which is actually what kind of got him the role as Apollo. Is he kind of was talking smack about Sylvester Stallone. And Stallone was like, I like this guy. I want him. <laughs> so, guys, that's kind of funny. It's like he got that role after some bit episodes of Good Times and a black exploitation movie or two. This was his big break. He played Apollo mm -hmm. Creed. Then following Apollo Creed, he would play, he would be in Predator in 87, Action Jackson in 88. Some of his biggest movies came after he played Apollo. And he'd be in a bunch of movies all the way up to like Happy Gilmore, he played Chubbs. He would be in a short-lived series called Street Justice for two seasons. And also the tail end of two seasons of a show called In the Heat of the Night. Other than that, it's a bunch of one and two episodes episode uh cameos he'd also do some voice work in video games but guys carl weathers is still relevant in 2019 as he plays the character grief karga on the new mandalorian series on disney plus all i know is that if you take carl weathers and you add in a little bit of sassiness to your script boy baby you got a stew going <laughs> <laughs> so, our next guest star is Mr. T, who plays Clubber Lane. Mr. T's name is Lawrence Tarude. He was born in 1952 in the rough south side of Chicago and is the second youngest of 12 kids. Damn. He was a high school football star. He excelled in martial arts. He was a three-time city wrestling champ. So, like, he was an all-around just Fantastic athlete. Brief wrestling career in 1985 to 86, then again in 94 to 95. So in 85, he would be Hulk Hogan's tag team partner in the first ever ever WrestleMania, defeating Paul Orndorff and Rowdy Roddy Piper, which he would have a feud with Piper for the coming year. Rig. No one can beat Rowdy Roddy Piper. Exactly. <laughs> He had worked as a bouncer at the Rush Street Club Dingbats. That's where he kind of came up with the Mr. T character. <laughs> uh, he wore a lot of chains that he took from people he kicked out of the club. And that actually <laughs> so great. led him. Yeah, it's, it's really a great story about him just, just jacking people's chains and stuff. <laughs> but it actually led him to being a bodyguard for like 10 years. He was bodyguard for everybody for... Michael Jackson for Muhammad Ali, like like he had this a long career as a bodyguard before just being Mr. T. Also served in the army in the military police corps. Once he got out of the military, he actually tried out for the Green Bay Packers, but because of a, of a old knee injury, he couldn't make it. And that's when he would really start getting into acting. Most notable for being in the A-Team from 83 to 87. He was also in a sitcom from 88 to 90 uh, called TNT, where he played T.S. Turner. He did that for 65 episodes. <laughs> he had his own Mr. T cartoon for from 83 to 84, which for 14 episodes, which was like a Saturday morning cartoon. But he'd also be uh, in other movies. He was in DC Cab in 83. And the first role where he played himself as Mr. T was Penitentiary 2 uh, in 1982. Actually did several tough man competitions. He did one that was called Sunday Game and another one that was called America's Toughest Bouncer. And believe it or not, <laughs> America's Toughest Bouncer is where Sylvester Stallone saw him and offered him the role as Clubber Lane. <laughs> so once again, Sylvester Stallone just kind of making... People's careers happen just trying to make this Rocky thing happen. <laughs> Dude, Sylvester Stallone's the Italian Dolomite. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> He's just making it happen. <laughs> Because it gets better. Like, okay, so he had a hand in Carl Weathers' career. He had a hand in Mr. T's career. Could You can't tell me that he had a hand in Hulk Hogan's career, right? <laughs> Hulk Hogan, otherwise known as Terry Belia, first broke into professional wrestling as the Sterling Golden in 1978, uh, before c becoming Hulk Hogan in the early 80s. He would start out in the AWA before getting the role as Thunderlips. In Rocky Three, 
which would help <laughs> propel his career and get him into the WWF in 1983, <laughs> which would eventually lead to him just becoming the Michael Jordan of wrestling. Guys, his role as Thunderlips is what got him in the WWF that got him in, in the wrestling. Well, thank God they didn't and, take the Thunderlips name. <laughs> aside from that, he would also do more movies, things like the Thunder in Paradise trilogy, Mr. Nanny, Santa with Muscles, and the classic Three Ninjas, High Noon at Mega Mountain. <laughs> hey, Santa with Muscles so, is a classic. It is. Our next guest star is Burt Young, who plays Polly. Burt Young's a character actor. He first got noticed playing thugs in movies like 1974's Chinatown and uh, 74's The Gambler. Obviously, he would be known for his role as Polly in the Rocky movies. He also played Pigpen in Convoy in 1978. Some of his other movies are he was in The Pope of Greenwich Village, Last Exit to Brooklyn, Mickey Blue Eyes, and The Adventures of Pluto Nash, although I wouldn't advertise the last no, one. No, I not Our next guest star is Talia Shire, who plays Adrian. She also played Connie in The Godfather 1 and Godfather 2, and that's about it, guys. Uh, <laughs> so she was in other movies, but just she, here's some of the other movies she was in. She was in Dim Sum Funeral, Pizza with Bullets, <laughs> Lured Innocence, and the whole she bang. <laughs> you know, I would imagine if you're in the first two Godfathers and then, like, all of the Rocky movies, or Rocky 1 through 4, then it doesn't matter if you do anything else. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, Why well, do you need to do anything else? Kind of good thing. It's kind of a good thing, because she really didn't do much else. <laughs> Our next guest star, uh, guest star is Burgess Meredith, who plays Mickey. And Burgess passed away at the ripe age of 97. Uh, I'm sorry. At the ripe age of 89 years old in 1997, he was born in 1907 in Ohio. He served in the United States Air Corps during World War II uh, and reached the rank of captain. He was a favorite dramatist of playwright and filmmaker Maxwell Anderson. Upon leaving the military, he would get back into acting, but then he would have some struggles as he would be named an unfriendly witness by the House of Un-American mm. Activities Committee so in the early 50s. And that would really dry up a lot of roles all the way until pretty much the mid-60s for him. He would start to get roles again in, uh, in the 60s, but mostly he would be known for the Rocky movies and for playing Grandpa Gus in the Grumpier, Grumpy and Grumpier Old Men movies. I mean, for real, for real here. That's probably one of the funniest roles in, like, movie history. Yes, yeah. So, another big role, too, and it's, you probably wouldn't, you probably don't remember until I say it, but he played Ammon, uh, Ammon in the original Clash of the Titans. Mm, oh, yeah. So... He also did a lot of commercial work for products like Skippy Peanut Butter and United Airlines. So, which is always something that we forget, you know, like actors do voice work and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Make a boatload of money. Well, not a boatload of money, but a lot of money. <laughs> Enough. More than I make. Enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. And then our last main guest star would be Dolph Lundgren, who plays Ivan Drago. And Dolph happened to pop up in our movie last week he was in showdown in little tokyo and so i'm not gonna go too in depth we went pretty in depth with him last week basically after a short stunt as a model and a bouncer he got a role as a henchman in a james bond movie and that would get him an audition for the role of ivan drago he would do the role of ivan drago in rocky four he would go on to have a massive career so once again thank you sylvester stallone <laughs> for giving me a role in one of your rocky movies uh because then i could become he-Man and Universal Soldier and all kinds of other stuff. I was even the Punisher once. <laughs> Hear more about Dolph Lundgren. Check out our last week's podcast where I go into a deep dive. Let's just finish up with a couple shout outs from the new Creed movies. Adonis Creed, who plays Apollo's son in the new Creed movies, is played by Michael B. Jordan. He played Killmonger in the Black Panther movie. He played Johnny Storm in the new Fantastic Four movie. Chronicle is a very underrated movie that I really like of his. And then as far as TV, he played he's played three pretty big characters in TV. He played Wallace on the Wire. 
from 02 to 08. He played quarterback Vince Howard from Friday Night Lights, and he's playing Alex in NBC's Parenthood. Already off to a just massive start to his career. The Creed movies, you know, they're fantastic, so we will talk about them later in the podcast. And lastly, I want to shout out to Tessa Thompson, who plays Bianca Taylor, who she is just crushing it. She's literally just been in everything big. She was uh, Valkyrie in Thor Ragnarok and Avengers Endgame. She was in the new MIB International movie. She was in Annihilation. She does one of the voices for one of the dogs in Lady and the Tramp that just got released, as well as the Creed movies. So, like, she's just literally just killing it right now oh, yeah so, and, and i love tessa thompson when they announced the first creed movie i think me and melissa both did the same thing which was i don't know like what could it be how well could it be it's like hey we're gonna get michael b jordan and tessa thompson being it. it's like okay let's go ahead and make these movies then yeah yeah exactly so there's your guest stars you know, through thank the you years, sylvester stallone <laughs> through the years obviously he's had such a hand in starting people's careers but also just recognizing people early and picking the right people for the right reasons in those roles and so as we dive into rocky 3 and looking a little deeper at this movie with Clubber Lang and what Clubber represents, which is as Rocky moves up in the world, things are getting harder. But then also Adrian's story and the Rocky story and, by the, and his kid getting older. And of course, you can't talk about Rocky Three without Eye of the Tiger. So this movie just has it all. Mm -hmm. Now, it's crazy to me to think that Eye of the Tiger didn't hit in, until Rocky Three, But... Eye of the Tiger is synonymous with all things Rocky. Yeah, exactly. It always it, that was definitely a surprise that that wasn't like there throughout the whole series. And this movie opens up where you see how Rocky is getting softer because of being coddled in boxing. He's got the money. He's got the huge house. Everything is going right. He's got the fancy car. He wears the suit every day. It's making Polly really mad uh, because Rocky is everywhere. He is uh, a pop culture icon and. You can't escape it. And Polly kind of thinking in his mind where he feels betrayed because his life isn't going to equal to what Rocky has been in Polly's opinion is always being that he is better than Rocky. Polly always kind of had that uh, attitude like he kind of created Rocky. Mm -hmm. He was kind of responsible for his success. When we get to the charity fight about a third of the way through in this and we see his fight with Thunderlips, that staged fight, mm -hmm. it's hilarious and what happens in it. And then it's also hilarious at the end that Rocky's, what was all that for? Thunderlips is like, hey, it's the name of the game, man. What else do you want me to do? We're here to entertain people. So this scene with Hulk Hogan, and they introduce him as the wrestler, this insane wrestler named Thunderlip. And they introduce him as seven foot tall, 390 pounds. Now, obviously, <laughs> Hulk Hogan's not really that big. Although I did, I was surprised that he is 6'7". Mm. And he is actually pretty damn big. So Sylvester Stallone is... 510 and that's actually being generous imbd <laughs> i understand like why they tried to make him sound like he was so like introduced him as seven feet 390 because they want to make rocky look bigger kind of mm -hmm. so they wanted to make it kind of a ridiculous scene with all the chaos and them fighting and everything it's where we first kind of see mr t's stalking rocky and we see all these different events rocky's big superstar now and so He's going to dinners and parties and charity events. And everywhere he goes, Mr. T's kind of like stalking him. And what, <laughs> after a while, it kind of feels like he's ducking Mr. T. It's also a sign of him losing his roots, right? And that's what will happen later in this movie when he goes back to Apollo's gym. And he goes back to his roots, mm -hmm. back to the dirty, dingy, dark, wet underground club with fighters who are who are working hard to prove that they're just worthy of, of any fight, let alone a fight for the heavyweight championship of the world. And you see yeah. how far he has come and how much he has forgotten because he's wearing that suit the entire time, too. We even get a couple scenes of him where he's driving around in that golf cart that looks like a Model T with his kid. Of course, it builds up to where we finally get Mr. T confronting Rocky, saying, duck at me, I'm the number one contender, you should have to fight me. And this is literally at Rocky is like trying to retire. Mm -hmm. I've had a good run. I've defended my title 10 times. I'm going to retire. And Mr. T calls him out. 
And so what we've seen through montage, because that's how you do it in the 80s, <laughs> is that Mr. T is actually very much like Rocky was in the first movie. And Rocky is very much like Apollo was in the first movie. I think that's why Apollo ends up helping him, is that he sees that. And I think that as we talk about the evolution of Rocky the man, and you look at how old he's supposed to be in this, he's supposed to be like in his mid-30s, and he's getting comfortable with a specific lifestyle. He seems to be taking things for granted the way that they are. Not just the things, but the people in his life, too. That they're just going to be there. That he's taking care of everything he needs to do. He's In the movie, they refer to it as him getting soft. But I think what we're really talking about is Rocky being comfortable with where he is. And mm-hmm. that Rocky, the man, as he evolves, and the, the world doesn't stand still. But he decided to stand still for all because he got comfortable. Yeah, which is why it surprises him so much when Mick, his trainer, his father figure, immediately tells him, like, hey, you can't take this guy. Like, this guy is, he's hungry. You're not hungry anymore. Like, this guy's going to kill you. And that's why it's so crushing to Rocky when he finds out that Mick's been kind of handpicking fighters for him. To try and protect him from guys like Mr. T, like Clubber. He's been protecting him from having to fight someone who's hungry because he's seen how comfortable Rocky has gotten. It's basically, it's exactly what he didn't think it was. Is that it's, he thinks he's doing so well and he's doing all these things. But it is what, it's what Mr. T said. That you've been, you've been cherry picking your people. And he doesn't know that. So then he's like, he looks like a fool, right? He's like all upset and trying to fight him. But it's true. What Exactly what he's turned soft and they're cherry picking his people for him. And it's been like put on a platter for him and he just has no idea what's going on. And later in the movie on that yeah. beach scene, that's really important where he's mad at Mick for setting up those fights like that. It's because it's that look of the world said I wasn't good enough. And the world decided mm-hmm. that they were going to say, you know, Rocky, you're about this good. And so that's what people were going to put in front of you. And it's not allowing you to get comfortable. It's that we don't think you're any better than you. Yeah. Even it, his even his closest mm-hmm. confidant and his like a father figure to mm-hmm. him really doesn't believe that he was good enough to mm-hmm. fight above what, you know, above his weight class, about what, what it is. And it, and it takes Adrian telling him, you can't let the world tell you what it is that you're supposed to do, even if you're afraid. You have to do what you think you're destined to do, what your dreams are, what your vision is. Mm-hmm. You have to go do it. Even if you're afraid, you have to go do it. Yeah. And she tells him that Mickey wasn't trying to hurt him, that he was trying to protect him because he loves him. And that's what he does. So throughout this training section in the beginning of the movie, too, where they're at the hotel and there's like the circus that's going on. And John, there's this. It's exactly what you're talking about. That in the original Rocky, Apollo's training with all the media there. and He's putting on a show while Mr. T is just in his apartment doing sit ups and push ups all day long. Just <laughs> stewing, thinking about that moment where he's going to have the opportunity mm-hmm. to be able to murder. Or Rocky Balboa. Yeah, they didn't do the scene, but I'm pretty sure at some point he's punching me. <laughs> or carrying logs. No. <laughs> this is in a wrestling movie. Yeah, and also he's like distracted because there's fans there and they like want to give him a kiss on the cheek and you know, make oh, like, yeah, this is not great. what we should be doing. We should be back at my gym. Yeah. You should be like working it with hung- other guys that are super hungry. Like, like you need to be. This is not right. And he's like, oh, yeah, Mickey's fine. pissed. Yeah, he's like, it's fine. It's yeah, totally fine. Yeah. We'll be all right. Just like loosen up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, he's like, Freddie Roach doesn't have to put up with this bullshit. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> There's a really critical scene here, though, and I'm going to tie this in with another movie a little later in the and the podcast when we get to it. But even through all of this training, Mick is sticking by his side and Rocky can't imagine, even though Mick has been telling him from the beginning, like you can't beat this guy. I don't know why you're doing this fight, but Rocky can't imagine doing it without him. And Mickey says, Hey, I can't imagine life without you. And he says at the very, very end, right before the fight, the media has gone. All the people are gone. It's just them in the hotel, practicing, doing the sparring. And Mickey tells him, he's like, hey, I just want you to know, I'm really proud of you. I'm really proud of what you've accomplished and what you've done and how hard you've trained and what it has taken for you to be able to get here. Now, it could be foreshadowing to say he's anticipating Rocky to lose and that he's wanting to tell him before that, but I don't think it's that. No, I think what it's supposed to be is that Mickey knows he's going to die. Like, he knows he's sick because it's earlier on, there's a little bit of glimpse of that where something happens and he just gets overexcited and he tells, like, another other person's like, are you okay? And he's like, no, I'm fine. I just, you know, I need a minute. So I think he knows he's sick mm-hmm. and he doesn't have that much longer, which is really what I think is it was that it's twofold, that he didn't want... Rocky to fight Clubber because he also didn't have it in him to train him. 
because he wasn't feeling right. Yeah. He wasn't feeling good. So like he, so it's twofold. He didn't think he so, could beat him, and he didn't think he had it in him to train him. And I think he, in his mind, he probably thought like, if he loses, it'll kill me because it's my fault. I well, shouldn't let him. I shouldn't let him fight. That's we, let's be honest, guys, because Mr. T kind of does kill him. He beats him up pretty good. So, but <laughs> I, I don't know if it's Mr. T though. Who's responsible for killing Mick? Is it Mr. T or is it Rocky? Because Rocky's the one that forces him to go through the fight because he his feels like his pride's been hurt. He could have just retired and started doing Cialis commercials like everyone else. <laughs> I'm sure there's some <laughs> Philly version of the Foreman Grill, like a hot dog roller or something that he could sell. I think we're missing the whole point here that it's all Adrian's fault. After Rocky left, she never took him to the hospital because Mickey was like, no, I want to hang out. Okay, but he's dying. Like, take him. You don't get a yeah, choice, old man. I carry you on my back and put you in the ambulance. <laughs> so we've settled. It's Adrian's fault that he dies. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so hold on here. I- I'm laughing. The jokes. So this is my first moment to say something heartfelt. I feel like to have a lot of fun, but I'm going to pause here for just a second and talk about this as Mick the father. Yeah. Mick the dad. Okay. Mickey trains Rocky. He has no one else in his life. He sees Rocky as his son because Mickey has no one else in, in his life. That is his family. Yeah. The Balboas are his family. He knows that Rocky can't win this fight. But Rocky wants to do it, and he stands by him the entire time. Regardless of what he thinks, he trains him and stands by him, tells him he's proud of him, tells him that he's going to win. And then when he gets really sick, his heart starts to have major problems, he can't make it ringside. He doesn't leave because Mm -hmm. he's Rocky's dad, and he's going to be there for that whole fight, even if it kills him. Yeah, literally. (laughs) Although Rocky and Adrian wanted him to leave, he was going to stay there to make sure that when his son came out of that ring, he was waiting for him Mm -hmm. and was going to talk to him. And that's why when Rocky came to him and said, we won and lies to him, Mickey knows that that's not real. That's not true. No, but it's okay because Mm -hmm. it's... But it's okay because at this moment that Rocky is Mm -hmm. here with me in my final moments, that I stayed here. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to tie this back into where there's another moment that has Sylvester Stallone in it. Which is a recent movie where it's, I may not be your father, but I'm sure as hell your daddy. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly the moment that he has in this. Is, and that's what finally Rocky sees. And as a real father, you see this moment that he is teaching Rocky to be a dad. Yep. And what it takes to be a father. And that will come up later in other Rocky movies. He needs help in that department all over. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, so, you know, it, be, at the fu- after the funeral, Rocky's got to go be mad at the statue for whatever reason. Because it doesn't look anything yeah, like I him. Was, <laughs> I was going to say, like, so So then, yeah, Rocky actually does get embarrassed. He gets his butt beat bad by Mr. T. Mr. T like, just knocks the crap out of him. It knocks his face out of oh. shape. Like, <laughs> Oh, did yeah. Guys, did you notice, like, the first punches he took his face with a lot of whack? It's like... <laughs> It's like sideways now. <laughs> so He's immediately like, I'm where... going to lose. <laughs> So we have a quick scene where we get Mick's funeral where he where he's hanging out at his statue. And it made me think, like, I wonder if that's, like, where he goes to think. He goes to his statue all the time. <laughs> and so I think, like, what would I do if I had a statue? It's like, well, I'd probably go hang out at the statue all the damn time. <laughs> be telling people driving by. That's me. That's me right there. <laughs> that's it's me. like the people that go ask Abraham Lincoln statue in Washington, D.C. What is he asking Rocky, though? What are people in Philly going to the Rocky statue? That Because it's, it's a real statue. You yeah, know, like, it's a real, real, thing, it's yeah. a real Rocky it's statue. It's a real so, statue. So pe- the people in Philadelphia go up and be like, Hey, Rocky, <laughs> you I'm thinking about starting a pizza place. What do you think? <laughs> Might have to cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> Got myself a dirt bike. I'm going to ride it around. <laughs> and this is when Apollo decides to adopt him. And then we travel to New York, and he, I'm sorry, New York, to LA. LA. Sounds like New York. Yeah, to LA, cause, and then they go to New York for the actual fight. Yeah. They go to LA, you go to the CD underground boxing training. That's where he's going to go work, but he still can't clear his mind right. There's too many things that are weighing on him. He can't get into it. Because Adrian's there. No, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he needs, what he needs to do is he needs to go power run on the beach in shorty shorts. And then, but see, if it wasn't for that scene, I would never get to see Carl Weathers wearing a half shirt and shorty shorts. <laughs> That's some eye candy right there. Carl Weathers wearing short shorts and a half shirt. <laughs> well, let's all be real here. First of all, that's the greatest montage in the history of okay. montages. No. Yes. 
we're going to argue about this because no, the greatest montage is in Rocky four where he drives in the car and he thinks about his friendship with <laughs> Apollo and it has that montage in it, but also it's him driving his car and shifting the gears really fast. Come on. The songs about him driving. Yes. The songs about him driving and about losing his friend and about how it really is his fault because he should have thrown in the towel. You may have a point because I almost got a montage inside of a montage. It's a montage instead of a montage of the best montages. <laughs> I don't know though because this is a montage of one man's battle to overcome laziness while trying not to poop himself while running on the beach. I'm just saying. Two, Apollo Creed should be fighting Clubber Lang because I Apollo know. is in amazing shape. He's like freaking <laughs> He's a machine. so much better shape. <laughs> oh my god when you yeah, see he's him running run. circles around rocky in all these scenes of him training rocky is like really trying hard he's struggling I, you mentioned the sudden diarrhea at the mall look on his face <laughs> while he's running on the beach <laughs> meanwhile apollo is a fine-tuned smooth and graceful doesn't it look like he's trying no every muscle in his body is like tight and firm <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Wilson's having a moment. <laughs> <laughs> We're not even talking about Michael B. Jordan yet. No. <laughs> so we get this this whole section of the movie where he's training, he's trying to make uh, with Apollo, trying to make a comeback, and, and so it feels like he's there for like in L.A. for like six months. <laughs> Which makes me worried about his kid back home in Philly, <laughs> still with the babysitter six months later. I know. But what's great is like it is we, when we finally get to the fight. It is clearly noticeable that Clubber has like a hundred pounds on Rocky, and yet Rocky's strategy is is still like I'm going to let him punch himself out. <laughs> like you get tired. Like, how is that strategy ever going to work? Because that's his strategy for everything. He just takes a bunch of hits to the head, which later on comes into play. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right? I mean, let's be honest. Rocky's strength is not in his boxing ability. It's his ability to take a punch and still come back for more and then punch you. But it takes it's a while the, to really get going. It's the Simpsons episode. It's the yeah. Simpsons episode Homer where Simpsons Homer becomes syndrome. a boxer. Exactly. Yeah. He's got, he's got an extra layer of protection around his uh, his. He hit you all brain. day with this surgical two by four. You wouldn't feel. I don't know. I feel like it's like it just takes him getting punched 150 times before he finally gets mad enough to fight back. (laughs) The only thing that I can say on this fight, on the end fight here, is that it's much shorter than any other Rocky, and it's only like three rounds. Fight aside, as we talked about the journey of the man Rocky, and then the journey that Rocky takes in this movie, and it's a short one in comparison to like the whole arc of Rocky, but the journey he takes from I'm comfortable on I'm top in of my the world <laughs> I'm on top of the world but I'm, I'm just comfortable with where my life is and what I have I have all the things that I need and he stands still while the world continues to move it really gets highlighted in here and then when he loses his father figure where the pressure is on him now because Mickey tells him in that moment you've been doing this for how long you should know what to do you shouldn't need me in your corner it's harsh in the moment but it really is this passing Rocky you need to do this now you're your own man you don't need other people to help you to do it. You need to figure this out. And if we compare that to our, you know, everyday lives and like the, the progression of our lives as we reach our mid 30s and move away from, hey, you know what? It's OK if I make a mistake every once in a while and I'm kind of comfortable with what I got. And then finally come into terms with, hey, you know what? Everyone I know, they don't live forever. And if I just stand still and the world keeps moving, they're going to move on without me. I need to continue to evolve and move and be a better person while also not letting the world tell me, hey, Rocky, you're only as good as like these mid-level people. Yeah. And we're not going to progress you any further. You just kind of can't. This is just kind of what you are. Just be happy with what you have. And then for Rocky to say, you don't know, I'm more than this. And I can be more if I'm willing to put in the work and control my own destiny. If I take and about I 150 that's... punches. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that's kind of what's so important about his relationship with Apollo and what kind of really caps off that relationship that they have is that Apollo saw him in that first fight saw himself in Rocky and helped him find himself again find that hunger again but at the same time kind of helped Apollo rediscover himself you know Mm -hmm. as we find moving on to the next movie I think part of that journey is is that relationship that the two of them have together and that's for as much as I love Rocky 4 and it is a great movie and it's one of the best probably one of the best movies of the 80s 
right? Like, yeah. Uh, hands down in the top five yeah. movies of the 80s. It's the only movie where they don't really move his character. No, he stays the same because there's so much other things going on. Well, I mean, yeah, not really. He doesn't move, but it's the same thing, right? Everyone's doubting him. Everyone's telling him, like, this is a bad idea. You shouldn't do this. You know, you're not, you have no chance of winning. I mean, even his wife, like, tells him, like, you have no chance of winning. You're just going to die. There you go, Adrian. <laughs> be supportive. <laughs> I mean, well, at least if he's going to die, be by his side. <laughs> God. I'm not trying to dismiss for, but in the theme that we're discussing like the evolution it's of not Rocky a, the man and it's not letting big, the world yeah. tell you what to be there is that don't let the world tell you what to be but it's like america versus russia and it's like the, the gorbachev look alike and there's all that stuff it's mm. more politically driven it's some it's really the only rocky that is p- politically motivated that that's what's behind it and it's like for love of country and all this stuff and he's trying it, to avenge his friend but it's a, his friend is mr america so yeah <laughs> i feel like two and four are more fun. It's just a fun movie. It's a fun sequel. Four is fun because it's Dolph and it's, you know, if he, you know, he dies, he dies. And it's got that undertone to it, but there's not this big, like, moral lesson with it. It's more just a fun kind of U.S. versus Russia, like you said. I think the only one that kind of sits away from the whole group is Rocky Balboa, which is kind of supposed to be Rocky's, he's old now. And that's when we first see him as old, because that's the bit, that's the movie where there was that big gap. Like I was saying, we're not trying to dismiss for, just for the theme that we're talking about. It's great. It's great. And if you were to give all of us the moment, it's like time to watch one Rocky movie. All three of us are going to say, okay, I'm going to put on Rocky 4. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, i probably go back and watch Rocky 4 more than any of them. In Rocky 5, when we see the evolution of the man, where he loses all of his money and this is a moment a capsule in time not yeah. just for when the movie came out but also for the age of the man mm-hmm. he's obviously comfortable but the types of problems that a person of that age what they worry about health problems uh-huh money problems mm-hmm. like what, Re- what child relationships yeah like exactly. that, that, that 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 you've cultivated his relationship with his wife mm-hmm. his like his future in general like what is he going to do also he he is struggling with that he's never done anything but boxing so he has no education he's got no if you could you could say that's very similar to someone who's worked at a factory job for a very long time and then all of a sudden that factory doesn't need you anymore because they've moved on and you know they've gone through technology and they have computers that do your job and then what do you do after that because you've worked there for 30 years doing that Mm mm-hmm and the fear of being that age, mm-hmm. having done the same thing day in and day out for your entire life, and then having it be moved, what are the concerns for you at that point? Yep. When you're looking at like, you know what, it's time for me to retire. What am I going to do with my life? Yeah. And what kind of relationships have I built as a person that when I suddenly have all this extra time, what do they think of me as the person? Yeah, it turns out his, his child didn't think much of him as a person. <laughs> <laughs> and the irony that is that's actual real child that is in, it's, it's, it's Sylvester Stallone's real son that plays his son in Rocky. It's, you know, that's got to be, there's got to be something in there for that. Mm-hmm. That's done. Mm-hmm. And obviously his son has passed away. So there's all that that goes with that movie. So that movie has significance. By the time we get to Rocky Balboa, the journey of Rocky, where he came from being the poor, no future, mm-hmm. in the slums of Philadelphia, looking for the opportunity to give, just to give a crack, a window of light, something, yeah, something give. to where he is now in Rocky Balboa, where he's realizing what he has taken for granted what's left Mm -hmm. for him in his life and what he would still need to be to look at himself in the mirror. He finds himself as a has been and this, this washed up local celebrity. And he finds this brief moment, this small opportunity to be relevant once again in a world that he pretty much doesn't understand. I like Rocky Balboa for many reasons, but that movie stands out because it's got There's some intense scenes with his son. His son is like, what are you doing? You're old. You are washed up. You cannot do this anymore. All I want you to do is like be my dad. Like, what are you doing? And also like, I mean, there's a different standpoint because Rocky is once again, he is down financially. He owns a restaurant, but it's not doing so well. And this opportunity comes around where he could be have a little bit of limelight, but also make some money. 
So it, there's no Adrian. She's gone now. It's just him and Polly. And Polly's like, this is crazy. You can't do this. Like, you're not fit to do yeah. this. But it's all he knows. It's all he knows how to do is get in the ring and throw hands. Everyone's telling him it's crazy, but like he doesn't see any other way for him to save the restaurant and to to basically get through uh, this lump he's in. I think he is desperate, but also I think he he really wants to see what if he, what he's made of if he could do it again. It's like a lark. Like you know, could I do it again? Because he's that's what he's doing in the movie. He's going around questioning people like to Polly. Like, what do you think, Polly? Do you think I could do it? And Polly's like, No, you're old. Like. <laughs> We're old, you know, and then his yeah, son and, is like, and, this is crazy. You're going to get hurt. Like, you can't do this. And for those who haven't seen it, the the base is around him having to go like two rounds or three rounds mm-hmm. with Antonio Tarver, who at the time had just beaten Roy Jones Jr. So it was like a big deal. He's a big name in boxing. And they're using a real boxer in the movie that people would recognize who's playing himself as a boxer. Yeah, so it's a, uh, it's a charity you know, thing, too. It's like a charity event. Yeah. He's supposed to like, it's like a like a exhibition. Like, you're going to last. It's, it's known all along that he's not supposed to win. He's not supposed to mm-hmm. even last. He's an old man. He's just going to go do this and get money out of it. And basically, they're going to make a fool out of him because he's just supposed to lose and like go down easy. Yeah, a little, a little did Antonio Tarver know that this would mark uh, the end of his winning ways as he would leave this and uh, promptly lose to Bernard Hopkins, the executioner. So <laughs> and, What we're talking about, which is the evolution of the man. And then by the time we get to Creed and we talk about the thing, the concerns of people of the age. In the first Creed movie is the definition of that. Ryan Coogler does an amazing job of, of showing what it's like to be young mm-hmm. and the challenges that they have and the, the, the millennials, blah, 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 blah. The challenges that young people have and where he's trying to make his mark in his life and how he connects with people and how everything, how all that stuff fits together. He does a great job of what it's like to be young. But then also the Rocky storyline of someone who's in their 60s mm-hmm. has to deal with health problems. He gets cancer. And, and that, after he lost Adrian to cancer. Mm-hmm. And she died of a, it was a long battle and it was long and drawn out. And he's like, oh, my God, I'm going to die like her. Like, what's the point? Yeah. And everyone he knows has well, died. Mm-hmm. And so now in the first Creed movie where you get that capsule of time and how the evolution of Rocky the man where he has come. And that when if you're in your 60s and you're watching that movie, you may not feel a connection with Creed, but you do feel a connection with Rocky and the things that are happening to him in his life where he's going to prove himself. Where the city has gone, where how his restaurant has evolved, what his legacy is, and what it's like to battle cancer. I think that that's what Rocky does great. The the whole franchise is it really it ages him up. You as a fan who would have watched it when it came out in the seventies are now in that same age bracket as him. So you're like evolving with him, and you you feel mm-hmm. like a kinship to that because you know like he's the same age as me, and I watched this when I was his age. I watched you know. When I started watching, I was in my 20s, too. Yeah. And he was in his 20s. And so now we're growing up. And it's realistic to what, what happened in those age brackets in those movies. I'm in my 60s now. My wife could be, you know, like your spouse can be dead. Everyone else could be dead. And it's just you. And now you get cancer. And mm-hmm. here's this young man who's like, hey, help me. Mm-hmm. Help mm-hmm. shape my life. And we were talking about how Mick had no one. And how he saw Rocky as his son. He had nothing left in his life. And here we get Rocky in his 60s. His son lives in Vancouver and apparently does well for himself, but they don't really have a relationship. Rocky is basically, he, he's lost Paulie, he's lost Adrian. He's all by himself. He's basically Mick. He's, he's, yep. he's Mick without a boxer to train, which is the only reason why he even entertains the idea of training Adonis. First, he kind of scoffs at it. Like, I don't want to let anyone in. And then he's like, well, you know, I'll, I'll just see where it goes. Basically, we get to watch the journey of Mick, but through Rocky in the new Creed movie. So by the time we get to Creed 2 and we see the journey of the man and what Sylvester Stallone has said, it's pretty much his his last. That's so what he said. Rocky, like him portraying Rocky, that he's retiring the. He's handed off to yeah. to Michael B. Jordan and, and for the Creed franchise. So by the time we get to Creed two, and then which is interesting because it revisits the um Russian storyline. Mm-hmm. Um, where do we leave Rocky the man by the time we reach the end of the story? He has in in the end of Creed two, it's made clear that he's done with boxing. That he's done, like he's gonna leave that portion behind. And he feels that he can pass on, he's passed on all his knowledge. He'll still be there for Michael B. Jordan, for Adonis. He'll still be there for Adonis and Tess and his wife and 
they have a baby. And so in the end of that movie, he goes on to go be with his son. He goes to go, he just shows up at his son's door after the fight between Ivan Drago's son and Adonis and Adonis wins and the whole thing. He's like, he's sitting there realizing like, I'm done with this. I don't need this anymore. I've, I've closed the door on boxing is basically what it is. And so then he he mm. goes and, and surprises his grandson, who he's never even seen. He has a grandson he's never seen, <sighs> and shows up at the door. That's a very boomer ending. <laughs> I, I hate to say it like that, but think—I mean, just think about it from his son's perspective. Basically, they've had like a rough relationship their entire life, and then now his dad shows up at the end of his life, obviously suffering the effects of taking trauma to the head numerous times <laughs> through his life. Hey, son, now you get to take care of me. Well, I think, and I'm going to toss it to Melissa on this, is that it's impossible to separate Sylvester Stallone and Rocky Balboa. They are yeah, one, of the, one of the same. They are the same person. And so knowing that Sage dies mm -hmm. between Creed and Creed 2, yeah. that moment at the end of Creed 2, and if Rocky and Sylvester Stallone are the same person, what is that saying about him and his relationship with his own son? Yeah, so for the record, in the movie, there is a scene of Rocky reminiscing. He's in his basement and he's digging up photo albums of himself. Because you know, it's the old days and have like, he's not looking at clips. You know, he's watching, I mean, he's watching VHSs of himself bo boxing. and But he's looking at pictures of him in uh, Apollo. And he's and then he, he stops and there's a picture of Sage, his son. At, from It's obviously from Rocky his 5. His real life son. Yep, his real son. Yeah, who, who plays right, his son. Mm -hmm. in, who in, also played oh, his son in Rocky and... 5. Just 5. I don't think he played okay. it in 3. Yeah, so in Rocky yeah, 5, no, he plays his son. Yeah, different actor. Yeah, three. so you see him, and he's looking at that picture, and he, you can just see, like, the tears go down his face. But in the movie, you're supposed to think, like, he's looking at that picture and thinking, like, what have I done? Like, look at this relationship that I don't have with my son. But in real life, you know, it's it's got to be Sylvester thinking, like, I lost my son. Mm -hmm. And also, like, I disagree with the boomer thing because I feel like at the end of the movie, his son is finally like, oh, thank God. I think his son was just waiting for him to come to him. To be done with it And all. to be like, I want you to be in my life. Because when he opens the door, he's, like, clearly relieved. And, you know, it's like he's always waited for his dad to do this. And Michael B. Jordan's, like, he makes many comments about it. Like, so because in Creed 2, much like Mickey, he tells Adonis, like, you can't win. This is not a good idea. You should not take this fight. You cannot win. I will, And he actually refuses to train him. He's like, I will not train you because you'll die. And I'm not going to be responsible for that. I already watched your father die. I held him in my arms while he died. So, like, he, he takes that. He, he's, he thinks he's being responsible for that. So I think he, he was just waiting his son was just waiting for him to come around and finally be like, okay, come to me. I'm just saying, from the perspective of the movie, mm -hmm. I get, yeah, he's supposed to go to his son and then they build a relationship. Like, he's finally building a relationship with him. He's finally making time for his son. I'm just saying that the, the reality of it from the way it's written in the movie, I don't know if his son, you, it, I don't know if his son would be as receptive. I know where you're coming from, which is in the grand scheme of things, when you look at relationships that the generational gap of like, I dedicated myself to my job and I did that forever and I didn't pay any attention to my family, which really is the story of Rocky, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And then finally it's like, oh no, I'm really old and I'm going to die. I'm going to, I want to make amends before things get too bad. Like, I, I totally understand where you're coming from. Yeah, I mean, I get that. But I also feel like he totally supported his son and, like, sent him, he did all, all, this, all this other stuff for him, like, in, in, the, I don't in know. Rocky I mean, Babble we just, one, was, so. we just got done talking about Rocky 3, where he left him for, like, half a year with a babysitter. <laughs> well, yeah, so, no, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Yeah. I, I understand some of the issues his son might have. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> well let's go talk about the music in these movies before we get too deep into our final thoughts here about how these movies all came together and how much we love rocky and how we'll be watching rocky for the next few weeks <laughs> let's go talk about the music first all right john there's a lot of movies here but you can't talk about Rocky unless you talk about the music. What do you got for us? Going through the music, guys, I noticed a specific trend. The song Gonna Fly Now pretty much shows up in every movie in some form or fashion. And that is the original Rocky theme. Gonna Fly Now is music was done by Bill Conti. And the lyrics were done by Carol Connors and Ayn Robbins. Sorry. Bill Conti is also known for doing music work on movies such as Your Eyes Only 
in 89, as well as Karate Kid 2 in 1986. Carol Connors is a singer-songwriter who began her singing career while she was still in high school as the lead singer of the pop trio The Teddy Bears. <laughs> uh, the Teddy Bears had a number one hit in 1958 with the song To Know Him Is To Love Him. Phil Spector specifically wrote it to highlight Connors' voice. Hmm. She actually would span several generations as a songwriter and singer. She was the only woman to ever co-write a hit Hot Rod song with Hey Little Cobra. She wrote that one for the Rip Chords. She also wrote Santa's Got a Cobra, also <laughs> for the Rip Chords. And some of the songs that she recorded as a singer are Go Go GTO, Yum Yum Yamaha, and A Swinging Summer. So a lot, of, a lot of songs about hot rods. <laughs> uh, other soundtrack work Carol Connors did was she did some work for the movie Butterfly, Fade to Black, The Earthling, Looking for Mr. Goodbar. She co-wrote the themes for the TV shows Lives of the Rich and Famous in 1984 mm -hmm. and Star Search in 1983. Two Man. of my favorite shows when I was a kid. Like, <laughs> I love those shows. Yeah. <laughs> Which, uh, I'm, I'm going to be completely honest with you, that's actually pretty huge. Like, it is so hard to just write a jingle that becomes popular for, like, a commercial or something. But to write themes to two ma major TV shows, one, The Lives of the Rich and Famous, and then Star Search, and the theme to Rocky, to hit it big three times is pretty special, you know, yeah. aside from also being a songwriter and a singer. And then finally, Ayn Robbins who uh, also co-wrote the lyrics. She did a bunch of other soundtrack and music department work. Other than Rocky, she did work for movies like Bubble Boy, The Rescuers, The Devil's Own, and she was brought back for the Creed stuff. Another trend with these soundtracks of the Rocky movies is from Rocky 1 to about Rocky 4, and actually pretty much in every Rocky movie, it features a Frank Stallone song. <laughs> Rocky 3 features... Push in and take your back. Take your back was also in Rocky One and in Rocky Balboa. And then there was Street Scat and Two Kinds of Love were both in Rocky Two. Frank Stallone is Sly's younger brother. He was a singer and actor. As a singer, he's kind of a crooner, kind of like a Frank Sinatra type. But he's most known for his song Far From Over, featured in the 1983 soundtrack to the movie Staying Alive, which his brother directed. That song peaked at number 10 and even got a Grammy nomination, but that's also kind of gives you an eye into his career. Now, Frank Stallone has actually done over 60 acting credits. He's released several albums. Pretty much what he's known for is mostly songs for his brother's work. Pretty much writing his brother's coattails. Aside from making music for the Rocky movies, he also did a song called Peace in Our Lifetime for Rambo, First Blood Part 2. <laughs> he did a song called Bad Night for Over the Top. Another song called You Don't Want to Fight With Me for The Expendables 2. Like, even now, he's still making music for his brother's movies. <laughs> he popped up as a boxing consultant on his brother's reality show called The Contender. So, he's had over 60 acting credits. But aside from Tombstone and Hudson Hawk and a Vice episode, most of what he's acted in is stuff called... Return of the Rollerblade 7 <laughs> showed up on the Hulk Hogan Celebrity Championship Wrestling reality show. Uh, and he had a short-lived sitcom called Movie Stars, along co-starring Don Swayze and Joey Travolta. Yep. Other, yeah, we remember that. <laughs> oh, we remember that <laughs> Other <one>. family members <laughs> riding their brother's coattails. Another mainstay in the Rocky soundtrack is eye of the tiger eye of the tiger first as you met as we talked about earlier first shows up in rocky 3 it is by survivor a rock band formed in chicago in 1978 i was waiting for you to say they were from a different country i was waiting for you to say they were from like sweden or something i thought they were australian to be yeah. <laughs> Survivor is formed by Jim Pederick and Frankie Sullivan, and they are best known for the Rocky theme, uh, which 
for this song, Eye of the Tiger, which was number one for six weeks. But they also had a bunch of singles that charted afterwards. They had singles like Burning Heart that made it to number two. The Search is Over made it to number four. And then like High on You and Is This Love and I Can't Hold You and I Can't Hold Back were all top ten singles as well. Okay, okay, but... Hold on. I know they're most known for Eye of the Tiger, but Is This Love is probably their best one of all yeah. the ones that you just said. Like, it's better than In my Eye head, I was like, yeah. Is This Love? This is love? exactly what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like Eye of the Tiger, but come on. Is This Love is a, is a ballad, okay? <laughs> well, and, and that's kind of the thing. Is like, I think, Is This Love proves that they weren't a one to hit wonder. Yeah. They had other singles, but Eye of the Tiger was what really was the birth of Survivor. To give you a little history, Jim Pederick was in a band called The Ides of March. He would leave that band and start the Jim Pederick Band, which would eventually break up. When your own band, the band named after you, breaks up, like, you kind of rethink your whole music career. Like, well, maybe if if I can't make the Jim Pederick band work maybe i can't i don't got it <laughs> you know <laughs> you make my hair bigger <laughs> so he actually he actually started about thought about getting back into making jingles which he used to produce and make commercial jingles and stuff and his road manager wouldn't let him go talked him into meeting with frank sullivan he'd meet with frank sullivan and survivor would be born they would bring in dave bickler who pederick had worked with making jingles before they brought him in as a single uh, singer would also bring in a couple former band members from the uh, pederick band <laughs> and form Survivor. Survivor would not see much success early on. They wouldn't see much success until 1981's Premonition, which would chart and start to, and would get them a little bit of popularity among U.S. audiences. So 81's Premonition would get them noticed, and that would get them noticed by Sylvester Stallone, who would come to him like, hey, can you come <laughs> up with a Rocky theme for me? That was a pretty on the on the nose impersonation. I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying. Hey. So and so they they I'm would come here. up with Eye of the Tiger, <laughs> and Eye of the Tiger would stay in the top forty for eighteen weeks. They yeah. would win a Grammy. Pretty much, it would fire them off that into having a music career. Poor Dave Bickler would get fired in 1984 after having problems with his vocal cords. He'd have to have surgery, and they just flat out fired him. <laughs> like, oh, you can't sing anymore. <laughs> okay, uh, you're fired. Let's go get this guy, Jimmy Jameson. And Jimmy Jameson was formerly of the band's Target and Cobra. So the Jameson era would last from 84 to 88. They would also produce the theme for the Karate Kid movie, The Moment of Truth. And that song would launch them into a 1985 tour with the one and only Brian Adams. Guys, oh, nice. they made the big time. Survivor <laughs> with Brian Adams. Like, that had to be <laughs> such a massive tour. How did that not make an episode of Vice Music? <laughs> they would go on to also do the song Burning Heart, which would show up in the Rocky IV soundtrack. But after numerous lineup changes, the band would start to go more pop, and eventually in 1988 would take a hiatus. So... From 88's hiatus, they would immediately have a 1989 Greatest Hits album. And that is never a good sign when you immediately have a Greatest Hits album because that is generally led by shenanigans following that. Uh, because you would have, in the 90s, a number of tours with different versions of Survivor, including the Jimmy James Survivor band. They would sue each other. Some of them would do solo stuff. Nothing really kind of worked out. Eventually, they would get back together. Dave Bickler would have a second career. He would collaborate with Bud Light and kind of help be behind the Real Men of Genius ads. Do you remember those Bud Light ads? Oh, yeah. I thought you were going to say the Bud like the Budweiser Frog ones. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. The, the Real Men of Genius. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was uh, Dave Bickler was behind that. So, so he may have got fired for losing his voice, but uh, he'd go on to do ad work. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, it's just a bunch of sh shenanigans. Still, I think they're technically a band today, but it's one of those where it's like all their kids are now in the band because I believe several of them have passed away. I know Jimmy James 
Anderson passed away. <laughs> but yeah, it's one of those bands. Frank's son plays the drums and touring with the Pointer Sisters. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I the Tiger launched their career. Karate Kids, the moment of truth would push him further. And then Is This Love would carry him throughout the rest of the decades long enough to sue each other and then have kids and join to join the band as well. <laughs> Beyond that, what I noticed was from Rocky IV on is when the soundtracks kind of exploded. You would have James Brown and all these big name artists would start to show up and it would kind of be scattered all over the place. The consistencies throughout the music soundtracks have always been Gonna Fly Away, Eye of the Tiger, and Frank Stallone. So there you go. <laughs> There's your music. I mean, it wouldn't be a music segment without Frank Stallone and uh, Don Swayze. <laughs> so for what it's worth. Yes. And um, Joey Travolta. <laughs> yeah. For what it's worth, I follow Sylvester Stallone on social media. He loves his brother. Like he goes with, yeah. he, will, he, will put, he will put pictures up with him at his concerts and like in his live shows. And he's like, best singer I know. Best, you know, whatever. It's like, oh, Sly. Oh, you can tell. <laughs> Obviously, we need to wrap up with our final thoughts. So the music, obvious, Frank Stallone, Eye of the Tiger, and, you know, the part that every time you think of Rocky, you picture him r running up the stairs and him getting ready to fly. So, of course, that was what we're going to talk about in the music. Let's now go give our final thoughts on this episode. All right, I'm going to kick off. So I, I love Rocky. Everyone loves Rocky. I am not a Rocky... Um, I'm not as much of a Rocky fan as Melissa, so that's why we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> let Melissa go last here and, get, and give her final thoughts. But I have come around more on Rocky and with these kinds of movies and the depth that can be in in them. One of the things that happens with these action movies, or sometimes when I watch like bad movies, um, like with watching Showdown in Little Tokyo last week, what gets lost in them is that people aren't paying attention to the depth of the story that is happening. And Rocky is one of the few gems where they're able to accomplish both be entertaining and fun while also providing character depth and one of the best things that the rocky franchise has ever done has evolved and given you insights and grown the characters as the movies have moved along they're not just insert some actor and it can be anyone that be in this role holly is burt young rocky is sylvester stallone there is no other people that can play them mickey is burgess meredith there is no other people that can play these roles and then as they progressed you got to go on the journey with them. And I really, really just want to highlight the growth of the man and who Rocky is and how his loyalty to his family and to his friends and how he always stuck true to them, no matter what was happening in his life, no matter what it cost him. He was willing to be there for them and give them whatever they wanted. In Rocky Three, when he goes and bails Polly out of jail for going on a drunken tirade and smashing a Rocky pinball machine, he still bails him out and then still gives him a job and is still willing to pay his way and keeps Pauly with him even after Pauly loses all of his money. Pauly is still there because he does not turn his back on his family or his friends. And then I also want to say for the evolution of the man is that undertone of not just if someone hits you, you get back up. Not every time you fall down, you get back up. But that you don't let the world tell you the way that you're supposed to be and that you fight that. And when you fight that, good things can happen. And he was never going to allow the world to tell him this is the way that you need to be because he looked at that and said, that's what you think. But I am different and I'm not going to be that way. And just because you think that's the way that I'm supposed to be doesn't mean it's true. And that's what I love about Rock. And that's why I continue to come back to these movies. And that's why, after all these years, and why I see through it, the extra connection I have with my son. John, what are your thoughts on the Rocky franchise? I look at it from the blockbuster totality. Like, like the Rocky franchise is one of those blockbusters franchises that like we talked about at the beginning of the podcast that like everyone's seen one of the rock they're aware of the franchise like it is that massive of a franchise and i remember when i was first introduced to rock at the the character and my initial thought you know because people made such a big deal of you know uh, sylvester stallone you know and the character he plays and he does such a good job and my initial thought when i first viewed it was well you know it's a slightly stupid italian man playing a slightly stupid <laughs> italian boxer like it's not a big stretch but the more i've learned about it and the more i've watched all of the movies now 
watching the collection, the the more I've grown to see like how massive of a movie it was and how Sylvester Stallone literally willed this movie to happen. Like he wrote it and he, he cast it and he did all put all the work in to make this masterpiece happen and that it really is it really is a masterpiece and like as you watch the movie like you said you see the characters grow from movie to movie and the fact that it spans decades and that now there's any new version creed movies that like that like you know dom you can share with your kids you know and they'll grow up with Michael B. Jordan as their Rocky. It, it's amazing at how big these things really are underneath the surface. Because when I first w- when I first saw Rocky for the first time, it, it wasn't. I didn't understand the totality of it. You know, it was just a movie. And then you watch the movie, and then you watch Rocky two and Rocky three. When we talked about doing this, uh, doing the Rocky movies. I haven't said like, you know, like I've seen all the Rocky movies, but I only really go back and watch this one and this one. But just doing the research and all the behind the scenes and so much of it is Carl Weathers was a struggling actor until he got an audition to play Apollo. Mr. T was a bouncer and a bodyguard until he auditioned to play Clubber. So many careers were built, including the band Survivor built off of this franchise and around this franchise and and like that's why it's so massive but then just going back and re-watching the movies falling in love with the the story behind it from when i first saw it till now like my opinions really changed on how i view rocky i really enjoyed doing the research behind it to see like just how much of Hollywood and how many actors and how many people were affected by just the by just this movie. Melissa, what are your final thoughts? I have many final thoughts, but <laughs> uh, so Rocky is more than a movie to me. It is my childhood. It's a nostalgic. It's all that rolled into one. It's it's actually something that me and my father and my brother all share in common. If you ask us, my brother and me both say Rocky is our favorite movie as a whole. Like there's no actual, we can't pick a favorite Rocky. It's just Rocky, the, the whole entire, <laughs> the whole entire movie catalog <laughs> is our favorite. So I have very fond memories of watching this movie with my dad and my brother. And like we like, my dad liked boxing. So that's another reason why it was you know, like something that we would do together. And I am one of the few females I know that loves Rocky as much as I, I love Sylvester Stallone, pretty much everything he does. But my favorite thing about the Rocky movies is that they can be both entertaining and fun and you can like lose yourself in it. And you are pulling for this person who feels like such a real character to you. Rocky feels like he's a real person. Like to me, he's a real person. And when we watched Creed and they said like, that's it me and the kids were all crying in that movie theater because we were like oh my god that's it that's the end of rocky so but yeah it's entertaining it's fun it's blockbuster it's got all these big scenes and stuff but it's also got so much heart there's so much emotion and heart in rocky but there really is no person no athlete or no star that has more heart than rocky literally his whole entire thing is that he puts his whole heart into it And that is how he wins because he's got more guts and more grit and more like just stay with it. Right. And he wins. That's how he wins. Not because he's got the best skill, not because he's the best, the biggest, not because he's the strongest, because he works the hardest. That's another thing that I like about the Rocky movies is that you can look at the villains and you can be like, you know what? Actually, in the end of Rocky Four, Dolph really isn't this big monster. He's just somebody who was like put in the situation and with all the hopes of one country on his back was like, I have to do this no matter what. So it comes off that he's like this big. But actually, in the end, when you see Creed 2, he's not he's not a monster. He's just a regular guy that's been left in the dust now because he ruined like his his reputation's ruined by losing to Rocky. But that's what I'm saying. Like, there's all these complex characters in a movie that you can just watch and be like, you know what? I can just put this movie on and I don't have to think about anything. There's not going to be any scene where I'm like, you know what? My kid can't watch this. That's another thing. It's it goes all the ages. All ages can watch it and there's nothing in it that's going to be like, I don't want my, you know, whatever, fill in the blank. I love that my 13 year old son loves this movie as much as I do and loves Rocky, the character, as much as I do. And that's something that I could pass on to him. And it's a movie that's iconic and everyone's seen it and it's there. The last little note that I'll I'll leave here is that we implore you over Thanksgiving weekend, watch a Rocky movie. Watch many Rocky movies. Watch all of the Rocky movies. Watch any of them. (laughs) 
as many as you can get in in this holiday weekend, we implore you to go watch them. And I'm going to leave you with two quotes to keep in mind while you're watching them. One, you're never too late to be who you might have been. Rocky was washed up already at the beginning of the Rocky movie. He was given an opportunity and it was never too late for him to be who he was supposed to be. Two, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Opportunity presented itself to Rocky and he trained and worked hard and proved that he was supposed to be there. He prepared for it, for the opportunity. And some people would call that luck. Other people would say he put his heart and soul into it and earned it in the end. Keep those two things in mind while you're watching all of the Rocky movies this weekend, and we would love to hear from you while you watch them. Email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com. Get us on Twitter at goalwiththeheat, facebook.com slash goalwiththeheat, instagram.com slash goalwiththeheat. We would love to hear from you as you go through these movies. We would also love to hear from you about what Rocky means to you. If you love Rocky, if you love the story, if you if you love the boxing, if you love the character arcs, we want to hear from you. Email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out that website, goalwiththeheat.com. You can find all the ways to contact us, links to all those things I just mentioned. You can also find the show notes. You can find ways to subscribe. You can get us on basically every podcast platform of choice. And then while you're there, you can find the ways to contact us individually. So if you have a special kinship with what Melissa is talking about, being that it is my childhood and that how when I picture family, Family and Rocky are synonymous. We would love to hear from you. Go to that website, find out how to contact us. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal.